Good evening, everyone from Korea. We are going to be patterning a 15th century Burgundian gown, and we're going to be doing it on the basis of a 14th century pattern um, that already exists because there's limited time for us to be together. So we're not going to be patterning this from, from measurements to fabric. We're going to be using an existing body block that's basically for a 14th century gown, and then we're going to be adapting that up into the full-blown Burgundian gown, which will have some serious modifications to create that. So you're just coming along for the ride, guys. This is not a terribly structured session because there's a lot going on here in the Contessa world. Um, if you have any questions, then you know pop them in the comments and I'll occasionally get to them, but I'm sorry if my response time is a little delayed by me, well, patterning. So let's get going. Okay, um, so first thing we have here four body pieces, right? And these were made a couple of years ago at this it was, point. It was COVID time. Yeah, we did so it over Zoom. It's 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 been it's been a little while. It's been a little while. But basically the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to lay them out on new patterning fabric. And by new I mean crappy old sheet that I've already cut into other things. And um, I'm going to cut out those pieces, or I'm going to lay them out, and then I'm going to put over top of it the pattern that I have for my Burgundian gown. And sorry for people who are up there in YouTube land, we're trying, we're, we're playing with camera angles, and unfortunately the camera isn't, let me see if I can change the angle on that. Okay, this will be better. We're still figuring out this whole live thing and cameras, et cetera, et cetera. It'd be nice if I just had a studio that was like permanently set up for all this stuff. That is not my life though, at least not now. Someday, by God, someday I will have a home that is big enough for my business <laughs> and my living. Okay, so let me show you, the, if you could get the, the pattern, the pattern. So um, I draped and cut this pattern that we're gonna be using 14 years ago. Let me think of that's right. 10 years ago for this one. Um, and actually it has a, a pretty a pretty severe mistake on the mock-up that I made from the pattern because I so wanted to fit the whole, the giant, giant pieces into one length of fabric for the mock-up that I ended up cutting it on the bias. So um, that means that there is a bias stretch in my original pattern and so that has to be taken in consideration when I'm laying it on top of this to get specifically the shoulder treatment uh, for the turn back collar on the Burgundian gown. So you should, if you don't know what a Burgundian gown is, uh, go look, go Google it. <laughs> You'll probably get the right thing. Or look through any of my videos and if I'm wearing a tall pointy hat and there's a long train, that is a Burgundian style gown. Okay, so this is an immense, immense, immense gown. And this is the front panel, actually. Um, yeah, this is the front panel. And it goes into a train, which is why there is a long sweep off to the side. So um, when I lay this on top of the piece for the 14th century gown, Again, I have to be careful that I take this annoying, stupid bias stretch into account. So stay tuned for that video, Top 10 Contessa Creation Fails and the Lessons Learned. This is going to be amongst them. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna move back a little bit. So we've got here, thankfully, um, these were marked, yes, front left, front right, back left, back right. As some of you may or may not know, thank you. Just keep that, try to keep it from wrinkling. It's linen, it's going to want to wrinkle like a son of a gun. As some of you may or may not know, um, humans are asymmetrical by nature. It's, it's just the way they are. So don't ever expect that you are going to be uh, the same on all sides, front, back, left, right. It's, it's just not true. Sometimes it's similar enough that you can get away with having two same front pieces, two same back pieces, and sometimes, in my case especially, uh, you really should have two separate pieces. Now, do I do that always? 
<laughs> which means that sometimes my bodices fit a little more comfortable on one side, more comfortably on one side than on the other. Okay, so as I was saying, the first thing I'm going to do is trace out the, the body shape, because the body shape is basically the same in my version of in my style of the Burgundian gown, I'm going for a Margaret of York style gown. And Margaret of York was known for her slinky, sexy, svelte bodices. Full, full skirts, long trains out the wazoo, but fitted in the bodice. And that's what we're going for here as well. And since this is for a gown that was almost 100 years earlier than this one, at a time when, again, gowns were fitted, swanky, and sleek, um, that works out pretty nicely for giving us the body shape. And I'm just going to actually angle, start angling the, the hips a little bit out for the flare. And we can always take that in if we need, uh, but this piece is a little bit, a little bit more fitted in the hips than it might be in Margaret of York's era. <clears throat> And, oh, did you, does this include seam allowances? No. Okay, good to know. I'm gonna add a seam allowance now. Pencil for the win. Okay. So I do not believe in big generous seam allowances because that is not a medieval thing, but you should know your fabric. If your fabric um, is not terribly tightly woven, then you might want a bigger seam allowance, but I prefer less than half an inch, honestly. And if I were working in a wool with a tight, um, with a tight weave, I would probably go with a quarter inch seam allowance. It also depends on how you want to finish your seams, which is something to take into consideration. Now, granted, this is still we're still at the cutting out a bodice and a mock-up phase, so you know this might not be the first time we do this process. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to add seam allowances all the way around. Now, arms eye. Um, so let's talk for a moment about the arms eye, because that's where I'm at right now. I'm at the arms eye phase. So there were some issues with Eleonora's arms eyes. So what were your issues? There is a great deal of pulling in the back. And just a moving, the arm movement is not great. There's a lot of tension especially there. Okay, so when you say there's not a lot of arm, uh, there's not great, when there's tension coming from the back, what does it, is it, because actually this looks like you get, you get full flexion so going forward. So this one is stretched. Okay. A lot. Right. From okay. the original. This one has stretched a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Okay. The silk one that I made has zero stretch and it is very Okay. Because it doesn't have any of that give. This right. has stretched out so that it's more it's comfortable. Of course it has. On the silk one is a lot of pressure across uh -huh. here especially. Okay. okay, so closer to the camera. So in, in the original, in the version of the gown she has now, there's apparently tension across here. And if you've got this line of tension right across that bulging shoulder muscle, what that means is that your arms, your sleeve cap is too steep. Your sleeve cap is too steep. So we actually need a shallower sleeve cap and I'll take that into consideration. Um, I can also, of course, this is stretched out, so who knows? Well, um, I had started it with a, I had tried to remake my sleeve block, utterly failed, I can't remember which one was finished. I can pretend to put it on. Oh no, let's, no, let's not, it's not with those pins, let's not do that. <laughs> It's not, I don't, I don't think anyone needs to see a gush of blood as you try to slip on a code I, RD that has stick, sharp, sharp pins I, I sticking out of it. I have successfully put this on and off, uh, but so yeah, it's got a lot of, yes. Okay, so this is the front left panel. Um, now this gown is, it's an over gown, so it's actually going to come in a V. And there's, the collar is actually going to turn back. It's the collar is actually designed a lot like a modern suit collar um, on men, modern men's suits. So it follows that basic patterning idea. It's an idea I had for various reasons many many years ago, and it sits really well and it works really well. And you don't have to worry about designing an extra attachable collar to it because it's all part of the gown. Um, so um, this front is of course 
um, you know, it's it's the Codardi front, so it kind of follows the curve of her front from the bust down into the waist and then flaring out from there. But in this case, we're not going to be doing any of that because it's going to be basically open to about here on this one. We're going to come open to just 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 about where the the belt, the wide the wide belt would normally start. Is where we're going to do the opening too. So what that means is that um, this this front is actually going to get a completely different treatment than the uh, than the code hardy would get. So I've now sketched out, I've made a trace around the side, and I've started in the arm's eye, but I'm just going to let that go for the moment until I lay now over top the front panel. And I think actually, yes, the other one. So this is the front panel, and I can tell because of the, uh, you know what, I think, let me see something, where are those other pieces go? Under that pile, the other pink pieces. Yep. The ones we didn't have a chance to. Let me just check. I think we probably ended up ironing out the ones that were not the finished ones, not the proper ones, but let me see. Yep. <laughs> This of was course the right we one. did. Of Yay. course we did. This was the right one. Okay. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, for those who don't know, I live a migratory lifestyle courtesy of the King's Army, shall we say. And uh, these got dumped, all of my patterns got dumped into a box by some very careless movers and um, were just crushed and came out of their bags and out of their envelopes. And we're just now finally getting to the boxes that had my patterns. And so, whereas I had before separated good final pieces and pieces to be upcycled or reused for something else, now we just have to figure out what's what. Um, so we ironed out the one that was the, not the finished, nice final finished piece, but the not final finished piece. So yeah, we'll have to um, do some ironing on the fly here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, in the meanwhile, I will be taking questions. <laughs> While Eleanor quickly irons the... I can't kind of this. Yeah. You can move that. Yes. I steal the ironing board. Yeah, over to the corner. Make sure maximum, maximum steam is on. <laughs> okay. Uh, so any questions thus far? I'm just going to check <laughs> the chats. Uh, live chat, all messages are visible. Okay, that's great. Okay, um, yeah, so if you have any questions about the patterning that we're doing, do please let us know. Um, we will be focusing today mostly on the bodice and the sleeves, um, and possibly tomorrow we might build in the skirts. What we also found out is that the big pile of sheets that I thought were meant for patterning fabric uh, that were unpacked onto my fabric shelf turned out to be my real sheets, which is great because I couldn't figure out where all my sheets had gone. <laughs> uh, so we'll not be using, we will not have enough fabric today to actually handle the skirts, which of course are considerable and long. Um, hence why we'll be focusing today on the sleeves and the bodice. And the bodice, uh, as I said, we'll be using a previous body block to build the bodice, but the sleeves, you're pretty much going to get the full patterning experience from taking measurements to drafting. So it's kind of a combo session of what we're doing today. And if you have questions at any time, do drop them in the comments. If you're watching this as a recording, drop the questions in the comments and I will certainly get to them at some point. Do you want to touch that one? Yeah, just focus on I am, the bodice. Yep, I am only doing the bodice. Now, uh, for those who don't know, I mentioned that I made a really, really bad error when I drafted and uh, mocked up this dress 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, and that was, I put the, made the, put the mock up on the bias on this giant 70 inch wide linen because I was just so focused on not having to piece together the skirts. And that was, a, big mistake, a very big mistake, because now my pattern has a bias straight to it, and so I have to be very careful about laying it out and not stretching it across the bias when I go to smooth it out, and I sort of have to scrunch it to make certain that it is the proper 
dimensions. So that will be going into a very few, very soon <laughs> to come to theaters near you. Um, Ten creative Contessa fails. <laughs> Um, and because that was definitely a big one and I will never make that mistake again and I have never made that mistake again but it was very frustrating when I made the final dress in silk with the no bias stretch and it was too tight in the arms way too tight in the arms to the point where it pushes my kirtle off of my shoulders or like up into my neck and I have to do all kinds of pinning stuff and that means this big bulk of fabric around my armpit anyway it's unpleasant so do not drape, cut or drape your patterns on the bias, my friends. And if you have questions about what the bias is, the bias is what happens if you rotate a tabby weave, meaning a square weave, 90 degrees, and then you get a diamond pattern and those diamonds will collapse in on themselves all across your fabric and then it will create that beautiful drape that you see in the 1920s, those super, and 30s, 30s more, like those super slinky, gowns from the 1930s and 40s yeah that's bias cut baby and it's great for that era <laughs> it's not great for the 15th century <clears throat> okay so now that we have the correct bodice pieces ironed we uh, we're going to get on with our business so i'm once more laying out my existing uh 14th century body block and if you're just joining, <laughs> the reason we're using a 14th century body block is because that's what we have on hand. And honestly, the body cut, the cut of the bodice, the fit through the torso to the hips is not very different in this era. And of course, the person whom we're making this, maybe Eleanor, she is, of course, also known as the Grey Lady Creates on Instagram, plug for fellow creator. Um, also, um, is wearing a coat, not the coat RD, the coat RD would be the overgown. Um, to come a little bit this way for the Instagrammers. Yes. Okay, is a coat, not a coat RD, which would be the overgown, it's the coat, the thing that's underneath, uh, because this gown we're making, of course, goes over a, it's called a kirtle in English in the 15th century, um, but that means it needs to be fitted over an overlayer. If you don't fit it over an overlayer, you will cry really a lot when you go to put it on. So you need to fit it over an underlayer, the underlayer being another gown, not just your smock. This can one, confirm. This I did this with my 14th century too, and it was way too tight. This it absolutely positively must be worn over an underlayer. And that underlayer must be a gown not just your smock. I know there are many people who like to have just, you know, one layer actually. A lot of people want to wear not even a linen smock, which I don't understand because that makes everything hotter. You know, wearing not, no linen gown whatsoever. Okay, so some of you can see in, and some of you can see and some of you can't, and I apologize for that. We're still working on camera angles and whatnot. Um, the, cut here of the front panel, which is this rounded part, which it would be the turn back collar you see in all the imagery. And then it comes into this nice little, uh, I don't know, that's like a seven o'clock, looks like a seven o'clock cut on on the shoulder area. And that that is what creates, what allows the collar to turn back over your shoulders. So Eleanor, unsurprisingly, has a much taller arm side than I do because I've got big meaty Contessa arms <laughs> and she has much more delicate petite uh, musculature than I do. Um, so that means that basically I'm just going to be, because here's, here's where her shoulder seam is and my shoulder seam is like two inches beyond that. <laughs> Which is why I laugh when you're like, we can just share dresses and I'm like, no, we really, <laughs> that really is not a thing we can do. <laughs> Uh, right. Um, so I'm, because I know we're going to be trimming this up and we're going to be fitting it, I am going to add some extra on all sides so that we've room to play with when we go to put it on her body and do some fitting. Because if I just assume that everything's going to fit exactly, it, that's just, that's not how life works, right? So when I'm doing this kind of 
this style of patterning, I always just add a little bit extra. Um, and also, well, over top of the gown. Right, so it's 30 over top of your gown. Um, so I'm going to, because if you look here, um, it actually, yeah, there needs to be quite a bit more because you want to have a lot of lapel to be able to turn back. So I'm just going to do this, trace this around and set that off at an angle that would be about what the angle would be if it, there were actual skirt panels. But we're first going to work on the bodice and not worry about the drape of the skirts. The drape of the skirts will actually come pretty easily once we get the other, the other stuff taken care of. And I actually am just going to go ahead and more or less follow what's kind of already there for me, um, just, just because I can always cut it down. And my gowns um, come, they sit, they're designed to sit, you know, kind of at shoulder edge so that you have this sexy wide exposure of flesh. Thank you, Margaret of York, for setting that fashion. Um, you know, as, as the 15th century wears on, you know, so for those of you who ever wondered about the Burgundian collar, um, it's, it's a direct evolution from the very high-waisted, very high-waisted or no, high-necked gowns at the turn of 1400, right? You even have you have these like high collars that come almost buttoned up to the chin. And over time, if you look at a progression of portraits or depictions of actual people, you can watch that get lower and lower, and then it opens up until it's just like this open collar here, and then it gets wider and wider and wider and wider until you reach the 1470s and it's this open V, and then in the 1480s it gets to be even this boat neck thing where it's almost off the shoulders, right? And I think it's probably in the 1480s where it goes from being a turn back collar to just like a separately attached collar. Although I haven't played with how to create a turn back collar like that and still have it set on the shoulders, I may have to play around with that, that design. That's my next step is a 1480s style burgundy gown with that, you know, it's super low. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. If you don't, let me know in the comments. Okay, so um, I have now, I'm just going to go ahead and follow kind of the line that the skirt on this gown follows. I take that line out a little bit from where I had it. You can always trim it back. You know, my motto is when patterning, always add a little bit extra because you can always trim it back. Adding into is a pain in the butt. Okay, so um, maybe some of you can see what we have here. Maybe you can't. <laughs> I'm just gonna kind of draw a line that sort of imitates vaguely the line of the skirt. Just below the waist level. Okay, and this was based on your front left. Okay, so I'm just going to write that down. I just have to make sure we put it on the right side. Mm -hmm. Or the correct side, on <laughs> the right side. Yeah, English is a funny language. Okay, um, and now we're going, to, we're going to cut it out. Do you mean to cut it and then this near one and adjust it? Yeah, yeah, I think that's the best. So I think that's a good idea. So we're going to cut this out, and then we're going to lay it on another spot of this fantastic upcycled sheet or repurposed sheet actually and then we'll fit it and we'll see what side needs to be adjusted how yep let's go ahead and do that okay so i could just cut this out and start the back pattern yep that's true just yeah just give a quick cut um so yeah um in other Burgundian gown news i have added uh for finally 14 years after making a gown <laughs> my pink gown with the yellow edges, the yellow turn back edges, I am finally getting around to adding fur. Uh, the original intention was for complete fur lining, but we don't really have, I don't have my fur coats that I've been accruing for years, my old fur coats that I've accrued from yard sales and eBay and whatnot made a hundred years ago at this point. 
Um, I Those all got sent to storage, but I wasn't thinking when the movers came a year and a half ago, and I sent a lot of things to storage that I shouldn't have, and things that should have gone with me uh, went to storage. Things that shouldn't have gone but should have gone to storage came with us. That's the way of it when you live a military lifestyle. Anywho, I do have enough old fur coats with me, though, that I had enough fur mink, uh, old mink coats from like the 1920s that I was able to cut out uh, fur trim for the neck, fur cuffs, and fur complete fur guard for the outside of the gown, which my uh, pink burgundian gown has like a 10 yard, probably at least a 10 yard hemline, if not more. Uh, so I have finally attached the collar and I've got the cuffs. Now I just have to properly put together the fur guard and then someday I'll actually make the fur lining so I can winterize it for colder events. Okay so here we have now I have laid out the back pattern and um, we're going to follow the same process here where I'm going to outline basically the, the like the armpits down to the hips of this and then I will lay the pieces of the Burgundian gown that I patterned for myself on it, and we will adjust as necessary. Um, and then after this, we will move on to drafting the sleeves, which I will actually be drafting, basically, um, based on a sleeve design that I also devised quite a while ago. Okay, and here is the iron ironed back piece. No, that is the front piece. The, the wrinkly bottom one is the good one. Okay, and here I'll try to show you. Here is the, this is going to be the part of the collar that turns back and hangs like that in the back. And see how that works. It's, this angles off at this weird angle so it looks really funky as a top, but then it just folds down and lines up with that shoulder seam, as you can see, and then hangs down. And that's going to take, this will be the trickiest part. This, this back flap thing, <laughs> it requires so fuzzy. It's so fuzzy, but once you get it right, it looks so good. Okay, now it has been, yeah, it's been a long time since I've actually patterned one of these. I believe I said 11 years for this one, and that was probably the last time I actually patterned a Burgundian gown, even though all this time I've been saying, I need to rework that pattern so that it actually fits over my kirtles and doesn't come off my shoulders sort of does come off my shoulders, but I think that's uh, in part because it isn't designed to fit over a kernel because I didn't think about doing that 11 years ago. Mea maxima culpa. So I'm aligning the waist of the pattern basically with Eleanor's waist aka the gray lady creates and i'm noticing oh yep yeah, would be useful if i actually put the back center to the back center instead of the other way around right and i'm noticing i've made a mistake i wasn't thinking about this part um, I need to leave more fabric. I need to leave more room for that funky, fussy little turn back collar. So we're going to reposition, find a spot on here where I have fabric coming from the shoulder in both directions so that I have enough for that funky little turn back collar. I think this will probably be enough. Let's check. We actually just returned from a really fun little event I ran here in Korea at a in a beautiful in beautiful in beautiful Changju, which for those who know Korea, you'll know whereof I speak. If you don't know Korea, you should. It's a beautiful country. Come visit me. 
but please let me know you're coming before you're done. <laughs> um, I will show you Korea like you've never experienced it before, but Gyeongju was the capital of the Shila Empire in the first millennia, or of Korea, basically, for a good chunk of the first millennium, uh, from like the 7th century to the 11th century almost, uh, 10th century, and was a powerful kingdom in its own right before that. And they built such beautiful architecture, and they built these pyramid-sized hill graves. So it's this historic city, and we rented a hanok, which is a hanok, which is a traditional Korean home, and just had a medieval revel there. We deeds of arms, and dancing, and feasting, and gaming, and I taught people to finger loop weave because everyone should know how to do that. And we went out and danced in this seventh-century pleasure palace, and we went out and swanned about in garb with lute, lute, live lute music accompanying us, we met lots of new people from Thailand, well we had people from Thailand come up and we met new people who were interested in joining the Contessa's ranks uh, from Seoul, so it was a really, it was a really great time. And now we're patterning. Okay, so I have once more lined up the bodice and I have kind of squished it so that it is not biased, bias stretched, or to make certain that it doesn't get distorted too badly. Okay, so um, because this back, this funky little back thing, uh, will change drastically based on the, the, the shape of your shoulders and the width of your back, etc., etc., I'm actually just going to kind of leave that vague as a big blob of fabric that I can then cut on her, that can actually um, pattern properly on her person rather than having to um, add pieces fully. Um, to make it fit properly if I cut it out too much exactly like mine. Because honestly, I've never upscaled or downscaled, rescaled this particular pattern before, so I am not quite certain about how the angle of this piece is going to change specifically based on Eleanor's different anatomy, because you know, my anatomy is unique, I guess I would say. Isn't everyone's? No. Sometimes some pe everyone is unique. Some people are more unique than others. <laughs> shall we? Shall we put it that way? Hey. <laughs> okay. I'm just gonna this up a little bit. So we got that. Okay. So once more, tracing out the lines, and why don't we go ahead? You have two pack pieces. There's nothing you can do. <laughs> nothing, nothing can be pinned together. <laughs> nothing, I need, you need back pieces to which to pin them. Yes, I did. Yes. Now, I do not have a sewing machine actually set up. Um, I have a treadle machine. It needs a new belt. <laughs> so we will be hand basting pieces together for this, pinning and then hand basting. Pinning first to get initial, initial fitting and then uh, removing the pins, trimming up, and basting. Um, so that will take a little bit longer than if we just had a convenient, you know, a convenient sewing machine. I would like to get my treadle machine back in action. My treadle machine actually has a very interesting story um, because we back in 2004, I moved. I was living in Germany, and we moved. And we had some items to take to the junkyard, actually. And we went to the junkyard, and there was this beautiful sewing machine that had just been delivered that day. Apparently, wow. a grandmother had died, and the machine was in perfect condition. Oiled, cleaned, ready to go, had a belt, had everything, had all the accessories, completely in cabinet. And the junkyard guy paid us seven euros to Wait, take it off I'm of his sorry. hands. He what? He paid us to no. take it off of his hands. Wow. <laughs> and oh I've sewn. Goodness. I've used that thing to sew two massive 15th century hub and spoke pavilions. Um, it will wow. sew through. It will sew through your hands, easily, easily sew through your hands. Oh my! Yep. And here I am paying money for my treadle machine. Nope, I did not have to pay oh. any money. I was paid. We were paid pay to take that machine. Ah. Okay, so yeah, I'm just cutting like this, I'm basically kind of sketching out this big square here, 
that uh, we're going to use is sort of, it's like a block of stone. It's like, so I feel like Michelangelo, Michelangelo a bit here. Uh, I need to free the dress from the fabric. But to free the dress from the fabric, I need a bit of a block of fabric, I guess, to get full liberation. I don't know, just go with me on this. That's fine. Okay, um, right, so we have a shape for now. We have enough for the purposes of this initial fit. Uh, we will cut that out and then we're gonna mirror that and I'll just label this back. Okay, so you're following yeah. these lines. Ignore this, mm -hmm. this line. All the way out of lines. Yeah. So I will show you then, in the meanwhile, how these pieces now look. Okay, we now have, we now have, this is the front piece as it currently stands. And this, again, this is not about breast accommodation. Uh, the kirtle will be taking care of that. Um, what this is about is, so you see how it, sits there now. So this is also going to fold back in line with the shoulder seam. See that? And then you get a turn back lapel like so. And we'll be adjusting this based on the actual fitting. Uh, we may have to add some pieces in to get the right fit over her shoulders and over her chest. We might not. It, it's, it, it can, you know, it can be variable. And I specifically cut a little bit extra so that we have some more playroom for getting that final, that final swoop of the edges of the lapel. <clears throat> so that's what we have thus far. Now I have, boy, I have sketched out in preparation for this a list. Oh, there it is. On the ground. Uh, of the measurements that we will be taking for the arms. <laughs> I did prepare something for this. It isn't completely random. Um, so for the arms, once we do the measurements, we're going to be taking an arm to shoulder to knuckle measurement. We're going to be taking an upper arm circumference We're going to, of the broadest part of the arm. And we're going to be taking a lower arm circumference, the broadest arm, and measuring the point for each of those. I should write that down, actually. Upper arm length upper arm circumference length and lower arm circumference length. So broadest part of the arm here, broadest part of the arm here, and the length from the shoulder to that. We'll be taking the wrist circumference, we'll be taking the knuckle circumference actually because the sleeves actually come to the knuckles and then you can have that turn back sleeve that you see in so many portraits. I think I've learned so much from this. What should I use for the second one? We need one more piece for the, the blue or the... Uh, for, we use, use the blue. Yeah, the blue yeah. is, the blue is, I kind of got that easily out. Easily markable. Yep, easily markable and about size, sized about justly. Um, yeah, and then we'll be taking the uh, shoulder to wrist measurements so we know where the sleeve, because these sleeves are going to be super sexy. They're going to be fitted to the arm very nicely so that they follow the shape and curves of the arms, uh, because you, you see in the very fashionable portraits from this era that they are really quite fitted. Um, and so we're going to be going for that. I'm not going to do to Eleanor what I did to myself, which was, dear viewer, I did not fit the sleeves over top of a kirtle and smock. So that means that the pink, the sleeves of my pink gown and even my red gown are almost a little too tight over the smock, which means that I can feel the strain over the muscle of my forearm, especially. Um, so Eleanor, though, is properly attired in two layers to in, in very close approximation of what at least a, a kirtle would provide. And in fact, she might have a little more in the lower arm since she's wearing a, a gown that actually goes all the way to her wrist. And that's fine. A little, a little too much is better than not enough. I will always, these days, always vouch for a little too much in terms of uh, width of fabric. Um, so we're gonna be creating a nice fitted sleeve with a turn back cuff, um, as if you go through any of my any of my videos and you see me in a, my my atour in my turret, my miter, uh, the, not a henan, then you'll see how fitted, how fitted those sleeves are. And that's what we're going to be creating today. 
Um, I will also be taking the elbow circumference because it, it follows this, you know, this line and also the length I'm glad I'm talking about this aloud to you, dear viewer. Um, we'll be also taking the uh, the length from the shoulder to the elbow circumference. To the elbow circumference. So we know, you know, where all of these circumferences actually sit, basically. And I think that's shoulder to elbow circumference. Yeah, that's pretty much everything I think we're going to need for now. Um, oh. Of course, the arm side. We'll have to we'll have to measure the arm's eye. So the arm's eye measurement is going to come out of. I always take that out of the bodice, so to say. So however, whatever we decide finally on the comfortable arm's eye fitting, is I will measure that, and then I will use that for the measurement to help create the sleeves. And these sleeves are actually going to be two parts. There's going to be a top half and a bottom half, and that will allow us to get that really that really nice fitting. Um, also, that really, if you think about medieval fabric usage, having two halves allows you to more flexibly use leftover pieces from cutting out the dress, the skirts themselves, because you don't need as big of a one piece for the sleeve. You can have two narrower pieces for the top half and the bottom half, and that's, that's what we're going to go for here. So. Yeah, in the 14th century, that's a good question. The question, if you couldn't hear it, was do you think they did that in the 14th century? I have not, so in, in, in the, let's see, Charles de Bois' pourpoint, with its really complex sleeve, it is not two pieces, it's two pieces top and bottom, but it is not, two, but that's because the shape is different. The shape is different. It's it's so less big. it's less shapely. <laughs> it's not quite as painted on <laughs> as the sleeves of the 15th century. So I don't think that's I, I don't think that's a great thing. Okay, so here is here is my block of fabric for that back collar as I spoke of, but here is how that body block looks for the back piece currently. Okay, so now we're going to pin it together. We're going to pin it front to back front to back and then back center to back center so we can both work in tandem and do this relatively quickly. So she'll take one half and I'll take one half and away we shall pin. Now, <laughs> when you are pinning or sewing, make sure you mirror <laughs> so that all of your inside seams are pointing in the same direction. <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't know how often you all, dear viewer, have had to take something apart because you sewed basically two right halves and two left, and, or two left halves instead of I, I've done a this. right half and a left half. Less frustrating when you do it by machine, the devastating when you do that by hand. Or I shouldn't say less frustrating, I should say frustrating when you do it by machine, devastating when that happens by hand. So uh, pin, pin twice, <laughs> sew once <laughs> is what I always say. Okay, so then um, why don't you make sure that your center, your your collar block is pointing at me? Here's the waist. Like this. Okay. With that piece underneath it. Other way. Be honest, the block is definitely playing with my pattern names. Yep. Bills. Okay. So, so that both of our so our side seams are pointing away from each other. Oh yes. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, I just then lay it out so that they're so that they're both laid out, you know, with the center seams facing each other or the side seams facing each other. But either way, so that there's no way I can accidentally do that. Now, which waist should I follow? Because these waists are pretty different. Yeah. That is true. That is very interesting. So, which? Um, well, actually, that might be a real thing. So, let's try. I would so okay. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you probably can't really see. Hold on, let me see if I can. Uh, yours has different colors. So, yeah. go ahead and let's hold this up from the skirt. Okay, so you can see that the waists are actually very different, right? And and so that might be actually on purpose. That might be the way your block is. Because if you're, you know, depending on how your front and your back sit, your, your, your front and your back meet, 
that might actually be captured by these different scenes. So we're going to ease these scenes into each other and see what that does. Good. We're going to ease the waist into each other. We're going to go from the arm's eye more or less and see what happens. Remember, this is still in the mock-out phase. This is still in the fitting phase. We can always make adjustments pretty easily. Oh, I'd forgotten how tight a weave this this white sheet cloth, this white sheeting is. <laughs> so taking a bit of effort <laughs> to actually push the pins through. Yeah, for those who have seen more recent footage of me in my current, the, the current iteration of my Margaret of York Ensemble, you may have seen that I am now wearing a, a silk velvet hood over top of the turret, and I have a veil that actually peeks down here in the front. And I think I've really finally arrived at the successful layering effect. I think this is the right one. Because if you look in the portraits of real ladies, and even in some of the illuminations of fantastical or legendary or pseudo-historical ladies, um, you will actually see there's this very almost translucent veil that comes down almost to their eyes in some cases, and in some cases over their eyes, actually. And it's coming out from under, what seems like under the turret. And for those who don't know, turret is the proper medieval English term for the not a henin. <laughs> henin is a term that does not apply to that tall steeple hat. See my video on not a henin for more information. Um, and so what I do is I put the veil over top of the, the turret and then I put the hood over top of all of that and that allows the perfect amount of peakage from the silk veil. Have you also found that it works well as pseudo sunglasses? Yes, so that's a, that thank you Capriol for asking the perfect question. <laughs> um, so that veil, that if it comes down just over my eyes, it's perfect for keeping the glare out. Um, and if you think about a lot of the context for when you see representations of ladies with the veil coming down just over their eyes, they're usually outside. And so that really tracks quite well with the purpose. And I actually found a silk organza that is the perfect weight, the perfect translucency uh, for the portraits I've seen. Now I've seen some people say, hey, oh, it must be even more translucent, so translucent that you think nothing is there. And I mean, maybe I guess I could hope and pray that someday I find an organza that is really even finer. But in the meanwhile, I'm happy with what I found because when I unfold it, it has the perfect folds that you see in the portraits, which is ridiculous. I shouldn't get excited over creases in Why? fabric. Why? But there it is. Okay. Yes, we, we absolutely get excited over creases in fabric. So, so, we, so as you see, with some easing, and not much easing actually, I managed to make those two sides line up pretty nicely. Um, and you can see the back is all flat, but on the front there's there's some slight wrinklage there, but that is, that ref no, you really can't because it's just bright and clear probably. But that's okay. You can see there's some slight wrinklage there. Um, and so that I think is probably going to reflect the shape of her body and we'll find out shortly. Now next we're going to pin the shoulders um, from and I'm going to pin from the point where these two edges would meet now. where the where the cor corner will meet from the corner yes. you know, do it from the corner this corner yeah this corner okay yeah we're going to do it from the corner of the middle corner. So match the, the corner, the joint, not the, edge. the joint. Yeah, match the corner, not the edge. Okay. And we'll we will be adjusting as necessary. Hopefully, not in a way that requires me to add fabric to anything. That would be nice. Yeah. So that they don't come out while I'm sewing them. Yeah, so um, whenever I pin anything now, I don't just do the pin 
once I actually bring it in and out and in and out of the fabric a couple of times so that they don't fall out. Because when I'm sewing, invariably pins start falling out. But if you put it in, if I can, you can see that it's in and out and it's, and it's in and out. You kind of sort of see it. The tendency of the camera lens is to be super receptive to light reception. It's redundant, but anyway. I like that idea because since I take, since I sometimes travel with things, I always lose pins. I, I've littered pins probably almost everywhere I've gone. So have I. And that is why I started uh, doing two sets of dives with my pin instead of just one set of dive. So that, because yeah, I also, I bring my projects everywhere. Some of you have maybe seen my Gamora video project vlog series in which I'm literally on airplanes all over the world sewing and um, yeah because I do things like that my pins need to be as secure as possible so that I don't you know share the share all my pins with the world like I pretty much have for most of my sewing life until I figured out to dive the pin out multiple times. I do always laugh when I lose pins though a little bit because I always hear of like people who go mudlarking on the Thames talk about the insane number of pins that they find there. Mm, yes I'm not the only one who loses my pins ever. Okay, here we are at Okapiton. Okay, so we are now we did massage. So we are now at the pin the backs together phase. So just line up back to back and then pin that together. Yes. And now, do you want to pin the stony block as well together, uh, or leave it leave it loose for now because I'm probably going to be adjusting that. So we're going to pin more or less from where, where it will start here at the back, mm -hmm. wherever that back hitch is, um, and then we'll adjust once they get it on her. And then we'll move to the adjustment phase. Pins, pins, more pins, special pins. Now I'm just going to go check <laughs> the comments. I'm not certain if anyone has actually left a comment. It's not, oh, okay, oh. Tommaso is present. Hello, Tommaso. And I don't see any, I don't. Um, and I don't really see any comments at on Instagram. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, do just drop them, obviously, into the comments. And I will attempt to uh, address them as they crop up for some reason. They're not always showing me the comments because why would they make my life easy like that? Mm -hmm. It is what it is. Yeah, Hashtag Contessa World Problems. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. It shows it briefly. So if I'm not staring at the screen at the time when it pops up, it's not useful for a creator, <laughs> a creative, uh, creative oh, live stream to have to be staring at the screen to see a comment that pops up. It should just be there, sitting there, waiting for me, or whatever. I suppose if I had a thousand or a million fans watching, that would probably get ungainly to have the comments just open, but my channel is still small, so. <clears throat> so we're just pinning the back together, and then we're going to move on to the step of putting it on her body, and then we're going to see what happens. Spiky, pokey things next to my person. So exciting. But you've got two layers between the spiky spikes and the pokes. True, I do. Yeah. My home helpers often manage to find my skin anyway. <laughs> They're helping me pinch things. I mean, you know, if you don't shed blood when doing a project, you will anger the gods. So really, blood is blood sacrifice. The, the Aztecs were right. Blood sacrifice is a <laughs> must <laughs> for success. <laughs> Jasmine tea that's over brewed. And actually, I'm going to turn off. Let's see. Chill. Okay. Right, well, yes. Now on to trying this thing on. Seeing what happens. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. Exciting. In fairness, it wasn't through fabric. I know. <laughs> <laughs> See, there's always a way. The pins always find a way. Okay. Oh, hi. Yes, we do. Mm. I pinned it very close.
close to the arm. Yeah. Well, and I pinned it up. Oh, you pinned it up. Stupid. Ooh, that's great. You that was them, did you pin them all up? You did. Probably. Did I pin mine up too? You were probably the no, smart I thing. No, I pinned it down. Yay. I mean, I'm glad I didn't. I'm not the one who caused the pain. Woo. It's my own fault. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> okay, so I can already see. Um, I can already see that the, we're going to have to lower the arm's eyes just a little bit from where they were. Um, and actually, I can see that on this as well, I would probably, because I can see where it's pulling on your undergown, ah. that it should probably be lowered a little bit. Okay. Um, or tightened, actually, ironically. So here's, here's, because it's loosened. So here's the irony of sleep arm's eyes. You actually get more, m more range of motion the closer it actually fits your joint. Now that doesn't mean that it should bind your joint so tightly that your muscles can't flex. But I mean is if, if your arm's eye comes down to here, that's going to mean, unless you've shaped it in such a way that it fits into that slot, um, that's going to mean that you have a much more limited range of motion than if it comes up to here, then you can move a lot more. Mm -hmm. So that might be a, a, an initial fitting issue at any rate that could be, could be resolved. Okay. So then I'm going to go ahead and pin in the front at the waist level. And we'll see, we might, I can already see we might actually need to add some to the front and the waist area. Uh, yeah, we might actually have to add some to the waist area. But for now, I'm just going to pull tight and make it fit. <laughs> yeah, and we'll deal with that. redraft this and we'll add some in the front. Okay. <clears throat> and interesting. Your arm up, it comes off your shoulders much further than I would like. So I am going to close that. I'm loosening the shoulder seam. Or rather, I took the pins out of the shoulder seam, um, and I can see that we need a little bit more there. Fine. I'm just going to pin. I'm going to pin it where it needs to be, where the seam would actually go, and then we'll redraft. Oh no. That I need to add seam allowance above that because right now there's almost no seam allowance. Thankfully, uh, this is over top of a pretty substantial amount of fabric, so we're getting a pretty realistic uh, feel for, you know, what that would entail. Let me turn to the side, please. Okay. So now we've got the floppy, <laughs> the floppy bits here. We're going to come a little closer. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm going, now I can see that this can be pinned upward, actually. And there's a little bit of bulge here in the back, so we can get rid of that. I'm going to just pin that in. And this should be fairly, fairly, uh, fairly tight to the body lines, to the garments that are underneath of it. Because you really do want this to be a sleek, svelte look. And I'll, I will take a pencil in a moment and I will draw over, basically I will sketch exactly where that line is. But for now, I just want to do some fitting stuff with these pins to get an idea of what is, where things should sit to continue making adjustments. <clears throat> Interestingly, okay, so, do you know is your right side bigger than your left side? Is your left side bigger than your right side? But you're right-handed. I, I am right-handed, mm -hmm. but violinist for um, years and years and years from elementary through high school. So could that have done things to the left? Yeah, I, I yes, absolutely. I mean, that's the arm that probably got the most work. That's very interesting. <laughs> you had a hair clip. Oh, hair I did. Clip. I might have taken it to the other room. Mm -hmm. Okay. That is very interesting because this actually everything fits you better on 
there's less adjustments needed here on the right side hmm. than there are on the left side. So that's that, fascinating. That is very interesting indeed. <laughs> <clears throat> so you know there's different um, there's different style uh, different depths of color, shall we say, that we could go with here. And um, you know we're going we're going basically with a relatively high back and uh, a <laughs> relatively low front. Now, are you standing up straight? <laughs> I was. Wow, that's crazy. Look at all that going on. Um, <laughs> when you are <laughs> being fitted, make certain that you have the posture in which you would like to wear the garment. And don't move, and don't put your head down trying to be polite, because that doesn't help. No, there's nothing, nothing about that will help. It's like, your hair is, it is what it is. Better to have the hair slightly in the way than to build a hunch into your garment. <laughs> yeah, no. So hold on, I'm just going to unpin the slides here. I'm getting a little bit of, uh, let's see if I turn the back maybe. I'm getting a little bit of wrinkling here in the waist, and um, so that can be, I mean, sometimes there's no avoiding a little bit of wrinklage for a really fitted garment, because it's just, it's just the way it works. Um, but sometimes what that means is that the waist is not at the right spot. So for instance, I can tell that if I remove these pins, the waist meaning, not her waist, but the, the waist, your waist is in the wrong spot. The waist... <laughs> The waist of the garment. So if I were to remove these pins. My, my figure has become Picasso painting, like all the <laughs> spots are in the wrong places. Your waist is not right, fix it. <laughs> um, if I remove these pins, you'll see the wrinkling starts to go away a little bit. Okay. And if I remove a few more pins, there's less wrinkling. And then what I see is that, you know, we can refit we can pin this back in together to create something that wrinkles a lot less. But also, you can see there's this sag here, right in the back. <clears throat> I should take out the pin that I already have in my mouth if I'm going to use the pin that's already there. And we're just going to pin up. And I, I'm sorry if you tuned in for a quick session. Fitting is never quick, or rarely is it quick, uh, for a very fitted garment. It just is not. But it's very formative. As the person who's learning as she's being fitted. Now, uh, a lot of people ask me if gores are used to create skirts in this period, and I say for noble clothing, absolutely not. At this period, they have really started to just build the width of panel you need by taking the strips and sewing them together to have a panel that's wide enough to actually um, get your full skirt panels in. Um, which is not to say that there weren't other levels where gores were still being used in the skirts. Um, but in this, you can see it in Margaret of Denmark's dress, which is highly debated as to its dating. I, you know, some experts claim that it's late 14th century, some claim it's early 15th century, some claim it's second half of the 15th century. But either way, that dress does not have a single gore. It's four panels that, and they've been piece together from very from the fabric so that you have piece 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 and one angled panel a skirt per quarter of the body rather than four rectangular pieces that then have gores fitted into the skirt to make the width and that just that creates a completely different drape you can actually see the difference between a dress that is draped with gores um, whose skirt is created using gores 
versus a skirt that is created using a circular sort of whole piece pattern. Um, now, the higher you make the neckline in the back, the more stability you are going to have across your shoulders. The lower you make your neckline in the back, the more likely your shoulders are to slip off your shoulders. <laughs> the shoulder of the gown is to slip off your shoulders, just as an FYI. One of the, I ended up having to fix, I ended up fixing the poor fitting in the shoulders of one of my gowns uh, by completely reconstructing the collar area and adding a whole bunch into it. That's on the pink gown, in fact, with the fur, with the fur trim. Okay, so actually, I think that is high enough. Now, the thing is, is that for this, this way, for this center back seam, you really want it to fit to the back. You don't want to have, see, there's this hanging right now, like I can fit a hand in there. We don't want that. What we want is this to really fit the back nicely and closely. Do you, so would that mean I needed to take a bit more out of that seam in the, in my crop top? Well, I don't, I don't know if it's a problem. No, I can't because I don't, I don't, this is, this is the part that doesn't have a seam in your coat. Oh, okay. In your coat. It's not, it's not there. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't come up this high. That makes sense. I'd have to see the coat pattern on or block okay. on you to see. Oh, I, that's I had thought you were under. No, no, no. This is, this pattern. is, this yeah. is the uh, pattern that we're going oh. on. Not your, no, I can't, I can't, in fact, I just stabbed myself for you. Oh, it's okay. Sacrifice has been made. It's a little, it's a little blood between friends. So then, okay, so now, I'm just going to look at the fitting elsewhere and see what we've got going on. Not happy with this wrinkling here. So we still have um, some wrinkling here across the back. Now, that could be an artifact of the uh, Pins out here and didn't put pins back in for the starters. Stupid mosquito. <laughs> that is great. At and least did we get him? Yeah, we did. Awesome. Good. The Dead smear, mosquito. That smear across the mat is the mosquito. I put yes. We have a mosquito problem here because the screens in our apartment have big holes in them and the mosquitoes fly up 18 stories, mind you, 18 stories and uh, visit us through the screens. It's, it's great. It's just fun. So we are covered in mosquito bites. The citronella spray seems to not really repel them. So that's great. <laughs> I don't know, maybe the uh, maybe the Korean mosquitoes have evolved to not care about citronella. Mm. We killed, we killed, we, 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 the ones that uh, didn't get, didn't, that couldn't stand citronella died of starvation, leaving behind only the ones who could oh. stand the citronella. Uh -huh. Natural oh, no. selection for the win. Oh. Okay, so that's looking less wrinkly. Top rear with that. And that's okay. There's most dresses have some wrinkles in the back without making uh, severe invasive maneuvers. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, now let's look to front before I really fuss with the with the color very much. Okay. So yeah, that is definitely a little too tight over your waist in the front, which is fine for now. We'll do something about that by adding some fabric. Because honestly, if I take the pin out here, then yeah, it kind of just meets mm. rather than having a proper overlap. So So now, before I start fussing with the back seam, we need to make certain, or by the back seam, I mean actually this, the thing that will be the dangly turn back collar. Before I start messing with that, uh, we need to make sure we have the shoulders right, because this whole thing, the collar, the turn back collar and lapel is built off of the shoulders and the proper fit around the shoulders. And so what we can see here, um, what we can see here is that this is just too, it's, it's, it's too small, it's too narrow actually. And that's even with removing some of the, the, um, the pinage there. So I'm gonna pin this back up to the point where I think it should go in a different way. And obviously the curdle that will go under this will, ho will hopefully fit better in the arm's eye. Um, now I did add, as the pencil, the scissors. I did add, um, you know, I added some, seam allowance all around on purpose uh, because, you know, wasn't certain how exactly this was going to fit over top of her body. Um, so that's okay, but I can tell that we definitely, I can actually see, so if you put your arm down, mm -hmm. you can see there's this wrinkling coming here and that's because it's just, it's too, it's too much. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and draw where that, I'm going to follow the curve where that wrinkle comes and then um, so this should not, right now the shoulder seam is coming off of her shoulders, and that's not good. That's not good. So I'm going to also find where her shoulder actually ends, and that might be another issue here, is that your shoulder seam is actually almost off of your shoulders. Where is that? Interesting. Her shoulder is interesting. Maybe not. Maybe you just have slopey shoulders. Yeah, I think you have slopey shoulders. Okay. Yeah. So that you actually see that in a lot of the portraits of women within, in, especially in the 15th century, in particularly in Italy, you see the sloped shouldered look, which is, you know, it's a fashionable thing. And I just can't, I just don't have sloped shoulders. I have very square shoulders from years of physical fitness training. So. I can't create that look, but other people do have slopey shoulders. I know. Okay, so I've drawn a line here to where the arms I should go on the left side. I'm really gonna write that right now. <laughs> yep. Uh, because yes, you are very asymmetrical. Oh yes. So coming over to this shoulder, which curiously fits much better. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess that must be that violin training we were talking about. Potentially. It's the only thing that makes sense. Yeah, so for the kirtle that will eventually go under this, um, we will definitely be um, adding changing the arm's eye. <laughs> uh, and, and actually, it's funny, now that her arm's up, you can see this, this wrinkle that forms here, and that's that tightness that would, that would create tightness if this linen hadn't stretched. It also explains why it's always her right shoulder that's more uncomfortable to the left. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, more. so the right shoulder is more uncomfortable There's than the left? There's always more binding across this, the right shoulder, I think, than the left. That's, that's interesting. Okay. Or let's say frequently. I won't be quite so dramatic as always. <laughs> dramatic to actually state a fact. Wow. Well, I'm okay. trying. I can't remember. <laughs> I'm trying to. Like, it is. I don't know. Okay. So. So I wanted to show 
Um, so we've got some wrinkling here and some possible binding, and it could be that this needs to be at a slightly different angle. First, I'm going to cut away some of this excess, and we're going to see if that is in fact the case that um, that the that this seam, this shoulder seam, needs to be at a different angle. So if you ever get wrinkling here, like you get a fold, um, if it folds out, like you get this poochy fold here, that means you need to change the angle of your shoulder seam, is what that means. And there's a trick for doing that, and I think I show that trick in something I've recently filmed, but I haven't yet published. <laughs> I remember distinctly discussing it. I don't know what in what I discussed it distinctly, but I definitely distinctly discussed it. Okay, so. That's better. Yeah, awesome. And I think that's because of the way this sleeve is. Because it's, uh, yeah, I think it's, what is happening there? Oh, and this is not fitted enough to your body either. Okay. Oh, that's what's happening. Okay, so her, the under, ow, that was the pointy end. The undergown that she's wearing actually, uh, because the linen has apparently stretched, um, is now actually, it's come away, or she's lost weight or something. Something has caused it so that this upper part is no longer really fitted close to her body, which is also going to limit her range of motion in in the mm -hmm. sleeve because it's not right up against your skin mm -hmm. so you have this nice close connection so that is also causing us some some issues in the fitting in the fitting department but that all notwithstanding what i see needing to happen here is i'm putting this to her gown the back of some to her gown so that i can follow where this wants to take me, so to say. So what I want, this should be smooth. So I don't want wrinkles like this. So this should be smooth. So what that has of course done is moved the arm's eye off of the shoulder. And that's fine, I'm just gonna, re, I'm gonna redraw it. But what I also see that's about to happen is that's probably also gonna create that fold that I was talking about. You can see it coming here. And everyone's saying, I'll just put in a princess seam. Eh, wrong answer. <laughs> that did not exist on this style of dress in this in, in this era. So I'm gonna go ahead and let that sit that so that it smooths over her shoulder properly. I'm going to have it meet this seam back here, the shoulder seam. in a way that makes sense for her shape. And I'm going to put the pin in at the point where I would like, from which I would like this to fold back. So this is the point from which it's going to be folding back, basically. So this this will then be the, the line of, of the collar, right? And so then I will ask her, is that where you want it to be or would you like it to be a little bit closer up your shoulder? Oh, no, I like it there, it's okay. pretty. Okay. Okie dokies. Well then, there it shall be. <laughs> okay, so that has indeed, as promised, <laughs> created a big pound. That's a soggy pin, isn't it? It's all pointing upward. Sorry. Yeah, that's going to bleed over the bleeding all over the place. Look at that. Fun, fun, fun. Because these are super sharp pins that I bought in Florence when we were there. Because I actually, in Florence, I did it, ladies and gentlemen, I ran out of pins. <laughs> I literally went through my last pin. I had not a single pin left anywhere oh, with me or in my abode, and we had to buy more pins in Florence. But we found a really great, um, a really great embroidery shop actually in in the historic center, and they had this beautiful, beautiful jumbo box of really fine pins. So, um. well, in future I will hopefully remember not to pin them up. I hope so, since I'm the one taking the damage. <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> okay, so I've adjusted the top, the shoulder seam and the front here. Um, and, you know, obviously that, like I said, that has taken the arm's eyes now completely nowhere near <laughs> her actual joint. So I'm going to have to reconsider that. So I'm up. 
Um, and I'm going to just look for sort of the edge of where, where basically it's like, you know, if I were a butcher, <laughs> it's where I would insert the knife to separate <laughs> the arm from, or if I were a cook oh, and my. I were separating Eleanor into parts for a spatchcock cooking. <laughs> That's what you want. You want the spot where you would insert the knife and be able to easily wow. disjoint, dejoint her. <laughs> I'm a chicken. No, no, no. You're definitely a human. <laughs> Chickens are much easier to pick apart. <laughs> okay, so put your arm to the ground down, please. Okay. So now I'm going to cut that away and see how that affects this. And then I might have to do the trick that I was talking about to create a smooth a smooth seam there and then you'll get to see what that is now when you're doing this try not to cut your fingers off also okay. try not to cut the fabric that's underneath also try not to try to cut through any pins because that will ruin your scissors <laughs> okay better when your arm is up at any rate. Put your, put your arm down. Not too bad. Still some bunching, but I think that is an artifact of your, mm -hmm. of the way that fits in your underarm. Unfortunately. So what I think I'm going to do is possibly have you take off the blue coats mm -hmm. once we just kind of get it fitted for size. And I will try, mm -hmm. we will try to adjust that arm's eye um, based on uh, your body unimpeded by this. And then, mm -hmm. and then what we're going to do is for the kirtle, she will use the arm's eye of mm -hmm. this gown to inform the shape of the arm's eye of her kirtle. Here's another question. Yes. This was one of the early gowns I ever made, and I cut the sleeve a bit too short, and I've spent a long time pulling the sleeve down, which could probably also have stretched it. Oh, yeah, for certain. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, and also, uh, the sleeve is on the bias. How in the world did I end? Yeah, your sleeve well, is on the bias. At least it was an early. Yeah, the sleeve is actually bias cut, which I mean, it, it gives you stretch, but it is also stretched. Mm, yep. And my slip one, I definitely did not cut on the bias. I didn't even pattern this on the bias. Be well, this is what early mistakes are for. Yep, to learn and grow. Exactly. And that's why we generally give away our earliest garments. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so I am definitely more happy with that. Um, I'm just feeling like... Okay, it's all happy until you put your arm down and that comes out. Um, so, I, but, 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 that all being said... Uh, So the other thing to remember when patterning is that fabric that is uh, possibly binding and creating wrinkles will be your seam allowance. So what I actually like to do when I'm doing this kind of fitted mock-up is go ahead and put in those easing snips that allow the edge of the arm's eye to flex, the, the, what would be the edge of your seam, to flex um, so that it's not bind, if, the way it would be <laughs> if you were doing a seam around that part and then that will tell me if I actually need to trim some off or if it was just the the, the inner curve or if it was just the inner curve that was causing of the fabric that was causing the binding and okay go ahead and put your arm down and you can already see that's actually better now that I put those easing those easing snips in to to the what's kind of turning into a sort of semi mock-up anyway a new bodice block, <laughs> a new kind of bodice block. Okay, so go ahead and put your arm down again. Okay, so thankfully we're not getting that poochy thing that I mentioned, so I don't, there's no need for me to do the trick with the, the garment. We are getting some binding, but that could be again because of the way the undergown is fitted, and I think it is. Yes, 
sounds like it. Let's see. I really, that's really my feeling there. Yep. Okay, so then I'm going to go ahead and just double check on anything else. So we needed a little bit more fabric here in the front um, for where that, where that seam meets. And uh, the other thing to remember, so right now there's no skirts below this, right? So eventually there's going to be skirts and that's going to put weight on this. So any wrinkles that you have now are going to vanish <laughs> under the weight because mm -hmm. Because watch this, wrinkles, wrinkles, no wrinkles. <laughs> nice. um, now that interestingly, there are no wrinkles on this side now that we've done all this refitting, right? But even when I pull down to imitate the weight of the skirts, we still have wrinkles on this side, right? Which means and we haven't done any adjusting here. So this side is still a complete disaster, <laughs> basically, um, because we haven't done any adjusting in, the, in that area. But the same thing applies on the back. So, you know, now we have wrinkles and you see when you pull the wrinkles again, interesting, on the side that we've done less, less, we've only done some adjusting on this side, the wrinkles partially disappear, but on the other side where there are fewer wrinkles anyway, the wrinkles entirely disappear when you imitate kind of the weight of the skirts pulling down on them. So that is something to note. If you notice there are wrinkles in your waist, if you tug, not, I mean, I don't, don't pull so hard that, you know, it comes off of their bodies, but just give a little bit of a tug and just hold it down, trying to imitate the weight of the skirt. And then you'll see if those wrinkles disappear, then you've got a good fitting. If the wrinkles don't disappear, then something else needs to be done. But we already knew that this side had not really been adjusted very much mm -hmm. the way this side has. Um, and in fact, now that, now that we're working on this side, <laughs> Um, well, let's get to the back of the arm's eye. Okay, so actually we have, it looks pretty nice across here, right? This is actually looking pretty good. I'm happy with this part. But over here, we again, we have some wrinkles on the side. Um, and that's, that, that's going to create binding. Um, and that could, again, be an artifact of this gown, and it possibly is. But even still, I don't like the way that's coming up there, because that's definitely... Um, not what we want. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and just sketch out my new line for that side. And I'm going to make it meet up with the line that I drew on the front half of the bodice for the arm's eye. And um, where that's bending is actually kind of giving me, that's telling me, if we can figure out what is her arm versus versus the gown. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking about this. I think before I actually cut anything off here, I'm going to have Eleanor, aka the Great Lady Creates on Instagram. Um, I'm going to have her take off well, everything. Um, not everything. She's still gonna have a smock on. <laughs> We're not going. Sorry <laughs> to get you all excited. Not everything. By everything I meant, we'll remove the 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 gown, the pattern in its current iteration. She's going to take off this blue coat, and then we're going to put this on over top of just the smock that's underneath, um, so I can get a better idea of what is her actual arms eye versus what is happening with this. Now the other thing to remember too, so. This is a densely woven, this, this patterning fabric, this is, these are densely woven sheets, um, but they're still not the same weight as the fabric of this coat, which is linen, which is a medium weight linen. And so the, this, this sheet fabric is not capable of fighting <laughs> the linen of the coat. So whereas if this were a properly lined silk gown or wool gown, for instance, it would just crush. <laughs> it would it would whip into shape this undergown to make it the right shape, which isn't yeah. necessarily the best thing either. But it would there would be less of this issue. Um, but even still, with all that being said, you can. I'm still happy with how this fit is coming across here. Um, that actually seems quite nice. And I'm going to go ahead while well, while I've got this on her. I'm just going to trace with my pencil where the seam will go. So this is not a seam allowance, this is the seam. So I will have to remember that. Remember that, thank you. And 
put in a, when I go to trim it, make sure that I trim it based on the seam allowance. And I can see there's actually a spot here down in the small of her back. Oh, geez, gosh, you're so bad at following. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I need to train my soon-to-be dance apprentice to follow better. Um, <laughs> I follow I, the dance floor. Um, so I need, I will have to add a little bit here, and I'm actually going to make a note on the fabric. Add, um, add some. Okay, hopefully I'll understand my cryptic message later on. Um, right. And, and one of the ways that I can really, um, you know, make sure that this, this is where I want it to be the seam, the back seam, is I can take it, and I think maybe I'll do this in three quarter view, yeah. Um, so what I do is I fold it in half, and if I feel like there's more that needs to come out, I just kind of feel that and trace along that line. Okay, yep, that looks pretty good. I'm just doing a last, last look here. I'm going to go ahead and draw the line of the shoulder on the back piece because I can see where it's going to sit very nicely. And in fact, I'm going to remove, where's this pin seated? <laughs> I'm going to remove this pin for now. Just kind of let that front panel do what it will. And I'm just going to fold this down and just trace that where, where that line is on her shoulder. And it looks like I've been coloring in charcoal on her shoulder, but there it is. I need to sharpen this pencil. Mm -hmm. So I can see that there's a much a big difference between the angle that we had and the actual angle that this shoulder that her shoulder needs. Um, yeah. Okay, so now next step is going to be to, well, remove some pieces. And while she goes and undresses, peels out of the... <laughs> oh, literally peels out. <laughs> while she didn't bring me to turn the AC on here. She's got more. I wonder if it ever stormed. We were supposed to get storms. <laughs> no, I'm still attached to the shoulder. Oh, right, yeah. I did literally do that. On, on, and on purpose. There we go. Okay, so she's going to peel out of that coat. And I am going to make some adjustments here. Okay. <laughs> the blood stain. Nice. <laughs> Right side back, right side front. And of course, I'm making note of which side is which is the best way of it. <laughs> Anyone else notice that it's so easy to write in cursive on fabric? Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, we discussed that we'll be making some additions, but actually before we, before we do that, I want to put this on over the smock and get an idea for how much was being distorted by the coat or making some more dramatic adjustments. Yeah, so you can actually see, very interesting what the body will tell us. So one can actually see the folds, the creases that were created by her arm being down kind of showing naturally where that arm's eye needs to go for a comfortable fit in, the, in this area specifically. You know, you can, you can play around with a lot 
um, and the arms out. You know, you can bring it in deeper. You can, I mean, deeper, deeper if you want. You can go for the Grand Assiette, um, and there's like a, you can see some evidence of a mini Grand Assiette, so to say, for in, in Germany, in modern day Germany, in the Holy Roman Empire in Central Europe. You don't really see evidence of that at all in the Burgundian fashions. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have been a thing that was done. And I say seams because sometimes they're not great about depicting the seams of dresses in those portraits. Um, or they're hidden by the turned back collars, so you couldn't really see where they were anyway. Although there are a couple of woodcuts where this, uh, from France and Burgundy where it's kind of quite obvious that the seams of these, this style of gown are very much here and not the kind that kind of cut really deeply into the back and come up as they do in Germany up until the end of the 15th century, really, on certain dress styles. Seems to have been a German tailoring revolution, uh, which is, it, to, which you can actually see clearly in the extant finds from the from Schloss Langberg, from Castle Langberg in Austria. Okay, so now she is in a my smock. <laughs> Because it fits better than mine. That's the one I brought for the event. It was, was the, horrible. It was the worst one you owned. <laughs> and I don't know why I did that. That was dumb. Okay, so in... Now, no matter how perfect your, no matter how perfect your mock-up may be, no matter how perfect your pattern may fit, when you go to create the garment in what is known as your fashion fabric, there will need to be fittings. It is just the nature of things. So just accept that if you make a garment directly from your pattern and you don't fit as you go, there is a 80% chance that it will not fit very well and there will be fitting issues. So I always recommend to do fittings as you sew if your garment is super fitted. If your garment's not super fitted, it doesn't matter. <laughs> or, no, that's not true, I lied. It matters less. But I always recommend fittings as one goes, which is why I'm very loath to accept long distance commissions, even though people ask me all the time if I would accept a commission for XYZ gown. And I'm like, hmm. Uh, not unless you can come and be with me for a week. Um, and I've seen so many friends, so many friends, order fitted garments remotely. And yeah, we, we're both, we've both been the people to help fix those fitted garments. Yep. Um, and in fact, one, one friend just got, just received what was supposed to be a new arming doublet and it will fit a human who's about six inches shorter than he is. Yeah, the waist, oh instead of the waist being here on him, the waist was here on him. <laughs> the oh waist should be here. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I hadn't heard about that yet. Yeah, so, um, and I, I, another friend got, received a Gamora made by someone in Italy, and it was immense, mm -hmm. immense in the upper part. I took in like six inches on both sides. The waist fitted fine, but in the, the chest area, it was insane. I'm like, what is this? What is this? Mm. So that was because it was made with just measurements and no fitting. And you you took how many, how much did you end up having to take in on that thing? Uh, oh, the, um, the, outs, the, the stars in the one? Yeah, did you have to adjust the some, of the, three some times. of the coats as well? Yeah. And then on the the coat, as I read the his oh, other, that, his yeah. other coat, his that other. one wasn't fitted though. That was bought by, and we just decided to make it fitted. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That wasn't made for him. No, oh, it was okay. not. So that's that's a tip then for buying the loose baggy garment. <laughs> <laughs> so he bought it for a much earlier in the century, and decided, no, after all, I don't want to do that. Oh well, okay. That's fine. That's mm -hmm. different. But, but yeah, the uh, the fitted the pourpoint or the jupon just didn't did not fit him at all. 
Plus, he changed his armor in between to much more fitted armor. Oh, well, that's that's not the tailor's problem, then. That's his yeah, problem. Yeah, no. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's his fault. <laughs> yes. I, th I think that was the major concern, was that his armor went from bulkier to extremely fitted, so suddenly the Jupon looked like he was wearing a potato sack. Right. We made it look not like a potato sack. Okay. So, yeah. okay, so um, we can now see <laughs> clearly that without the uh, distortions caused by the arm's eye of the not perfect coat, perfectly fitted coat, or the stretched out coat, um, we have a much better situation going on here. Um, how does that feel now that the... That's the picture. Yeah, right. Okay, that's what I kind of thought. Okay, yes. so let me show you what we now have. Um, this sits much, much better now. Um, and, yeah. I'm gonna move this real quick. Yes, the absolutely. The light is making it hard to see yeah. with the lights. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, now that we no longer have the blue, we've got white on white. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> With white lights in the background, white shirt on, white skin. It's, it's just a really, <laughs> it's a white evening here, apparently. <laughs> How pale can you go? Um, okay, so, yeah, so that definitely fits much better. Okay, oh, please put your arm on. Much better. Now we're still getting a little bit of wrinkling here. So that kind of tells me that I do maybe need to bring this in, but, but here's the thing. If I bring this in too much, I am concerned that with a curl, a properly fitted curl underneath, that's going to make it too tight. And then you're going to have the same issue I have with my current red gown. Right, which I don't have with the pink gown because I completely reconstructed the upper area of the pink gown. It was so much fun, and yeah, it's great. I'll have to do Whoa. a close up. I'll have to do a close up of that reconstruction job. It's um. it's a masterpiece of tailoring, I will tell you. And I'm not being. There's no reason for false modesty. I'm proud of that fix because oh, it was. Nice. It was. It yeah. So okay. So if you ever wonder, you're like, oh, Charlotte the Blouse Poor Pod has like 17 pieces in one of the sleeves and like 15 in the other. Why does it have that? Let me tell you, boys and girls, if your sleeve doesn't fit properly in your arm's eye and you need more room, more pieces, more, more <laughs> to make it actually sit and work with your arm joint, you start adding random pieces of silk until it fits properly. And so, my, the, if archaeologists ever find my gown, <laughs> besides being confused, <laughs> besides being confused, they're going, textile historians are going to go, why did she put these pieces in here? Are they <laughs> functional or is it aesthetic? <laughs> they're functional. They're functional, but they're functional <laughs> because um, I had to make I had to make a different arm. I had to make a different sleeve cap completely to fit with. Yeah, so that's the story, of boys and girls, of accidental authenticity. <laughs> um, Experimental archaeology at its finest. That's we, right. we learn as we build. We learn as we build. Okay, so this is a little far back on our shoulder. Actually, I would like this to come a little bit more forward. Um, and by forward, so what I mean is the shoulder seam. Maybe I would like it to come more far forward. So I say that because as I'm thinking here, uh, the uh, farsetto of Diego di Cavanilla and the Gamora of, the, of Beato Osana um, which are Italian, but still kind of contemporaneous, more or less, with this gown. Their shoulder seams are actually a little far back. They're actually not up here; they're back here. And you see that tendency for certain as the as you move into the 16th century and the 16th century wears on, the seam stops being here and it starts being here. And actually, there's probably really good reasons for that because it takes the there's no more pulling a, a seam here. You've got a different sort of, it's, it probably reduces this, I'm pretty certain having a gown like that myself, it reduces the stress on, there's no shoulder seam stress because it's back here, the seam is here. So uh, we might actually just go with where this is currently and see if I can make that work in terms of, it's interesting how that seam moved back when we, well maybe not because you took off the thing. So what I want to remember though, is what I'm trying to keep in mind here, when I'm putting these pins in it, trying to account for vaguely the thickness that we're going to have if she's wearing a curl, right? A curl that goes all the way around and takes up that space. So I'm not gonna pin this down to her skin because that will create the problem that I have. So I'm trying to keep that in mind as I do this. 
And the reason we have to do it this way, ladies and gentlemen, is because we live on opposite sides of the planet, like literally. Like I'm in Korea right now, and she's in Pennsylvania, United States. Yes, right now. I'm in Pennsylvania yes. right now. Yes, I'm we are. Magically, this is my ghost. It's not me. Yes. Actually, it's a holographic projection. This is virtual reality at its finest. <laughs> With haptics. <laughs> With haptics. No, but she lives She lives in Pennsylvania, and I currently am spending a lot of time in Korea. And um, so, and even if I were in the United States, my home of record is Washington State. So we would be separated by a continent in any case. Um, so we have to do this now before she has a curdle made, which is not ideal. It would have been best if she made a curdle first. Well, but it's halfway done. But it's it is. But it is what since it, is. it was also based off of the well, it wouldn't have stretched because it would have been worn. It would have found out if that pattern was in fact accurate or not. Mm. Anywho, <laughs> um, I'm trying to account for that soon to be curdle um, in setting up this shoulder. And um, also, so I've got it pinned in the front. That's fine. This we never unpinned, but this, hold on. Yeah, this one. There we go. So she's wearing my smock because my smock fits much better than her smock, even though my smock is designed for a broad shouldered lass, namely myself. <laughs> um, and Eleanor has much more dainty shoulders than I do, but most women do. I have kind of ox like shoulders. That's okay. When I was in ninth, when I was in fourth grade, you know, they went to do the scoliosis test, and you know where they they touch your shoulders and they touch your back. And the nurse said, "It's easier to do these scoliosis tests if you're not wearing shoulder pads." And I said, "I'm not, I'm not wearing shoulder pads, Nurse Smith." And she's like, "Oh," <laughs> and that was I was not I was that was not like that was not when I was in my fit stage. That was when I was in my pudgy girl stage. And uh, so I just had, I've just always had broad shoulders. Broad, shoulder padded shoulders, I guess. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah. I'm pretty happy with, I think I'm going to still make an adjustment here in the back um, for that arm's eye. Um, because it is still wrinkling down and I think I'm going to put in a couple of easing snips just to see if that is what's causing it because obviously when we sew that when we sew the sleeves in you'll make these little easing snips so that it goes around your shoulder so they will be there so I want to see if putting in these easing snips actually eases this enough that I don't actually need to take any away but if it's still wrinkling in an angry fashion, then I will take some of this, some of this away. Because my pencil is okay. Okay, and that's definitely gonna come off anyway because I can see that that is the top half. Okay, um, arm, arm down. Now that we've taken the curdle off, well, that was to be expected that it was going to change the way everything sat. That's, that's fine because there will be fabric there again someday, yes. someday. But we still have some wrinkling here across the back. Um, but what I'm going to do, or across the back, across the, the shoulder, but I'm just going to pull on this um, in the spot where I kind of made the line of where I want my shoulder seam to be once you know, when, when it actually has fabric underneath of it. And you can see that that definitely improves that wrinkling situation, but definitely we still need some more, we need to come in a little bit more on down here, particularly, which is not surprising. We need to just trim away a little bit here, trim into this, make this arm's eye a little deeper, as it were. I'm just listening and not seeing. When in deeper, do you mean this way? Okay. Deeper, deeper meaning a 
For, yeah, a, a, okay. a more rounder cut rather than a more shallow cut. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to not necessarily call that good, but let's see. Okay, so that actually, trimming, trimming back there actually took care of a good deal of that wrinkling. So you can see this is now already fitting much more nicely through here. And um, yeah, actually that's, that is much better. There's still a line though that's forming here. How does it feel when you put your arm down? How does it feel? I don't really feel anything. Okay, well that's, that's usually a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, it doesn't feel like there's the fabric there the way it usually does. Right. Stupid smock. Do I pin it to the strap? I don't, I think that's going to pull your strap off, actually. Oh. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that because it's binding you in your arms a little bit, so it's pulling itself off, basically. Okay. Which is okay, whatever. So, yeah, we've got that. We have now in the front, when her arm's up, it fits perfectly. That's great. Uh, when her arm goes down, you get a slight wrinkling, but not anything that actually alarms me or makes me want to change anything because by pulling your arm down, um, for one, it's going to be mostly hidden by a turn back collar. Um, two, I think that's just the way it's going. That's just kind of. Does it feel like it's binding you? No. That's the important part. It does not. Okay. So I am actually, I'm just going to, I'm going to put a, I'm not going to trim any away. I'm just going to make that incision a little deeper. Let's see if that gets rid of that wrinkle. Okay. It feels extremely. Yeah, that actually that actually did a lot. That, yeah, that's, I have that's perfect. That's that's pretty much perfect at this point. So you'll notice there's no more wrinkling here at all. Not a single bit. It just smoothly. We turn you sideways. Bring you closer to the cameras. It now smoothly goes around her arm's eye. So all I did was basically for this fitting bit, I just made incisions with the scissors around the arm's eye, going into it, so perpendicular to the arm's eye. And I just made them a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper until it reached the right depth for this to lay with no wrinkles. And now I know that where those incisions end is where the arm's eye needs to be. Mm. I'm just gonna move you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so that you know, I'm, not, I'm not talking to my hands. <laughs> um, they're not just thinking at my hands. Yeah. So now I know that where those incisions end is basically where the arm's eye needs, the actual seam needs to go. That's where the actual seam needs to go. And so you can always look, and if you see more wrinkling happening, then you can kind of trace the wrinkle to the spot where of its point of origin. You can just twist your arm off. <laughs> fine. Okay. Okay, go ahead and put your arm down. Yep. So now we've got some pretty, some pretty nice smoothness happening here. And then again, you know, you trust, you always want to kind of, when you're fitting, you do want to imitate the effect of the skirts. So you don't want to, again, you don't want to pull hard, but just a little firmly, just firmly enough, you can kind of imagine the weight of the skirts, uh, which will be pretty immense, <laughs> actually, on this gown. And I have will be a lot of picked up your dress off the floor. I know how heavy it is. <laughs> it's, uh, it's depending, I mean, obviously, shorter skirts have less, have less immensity. Longer skirts have more immensity. Um, but yeah, I'm going to call that good on the arm's eye, on the arm's eye front. Okay, so we have a nice smooth arm's eye in the front, um, and we'll be following basically that, that line of snips. And I'm just going to locate my pencil, <laughs> and um, happily, this makes me so happy, um, the, the line that I drew actually connects, but <laughs> still. Oh, from nice. one from one point one side to the other, so oh, that's, that's that's really nice. Okay, now now what we're going to need to see here is where your arm bends. 
So I think that will actually be good. I think that will be a good place to put where it is right now is a good place to put the seam. Um, so I'm just going to trace that around. Okay, so that is all good. Arm's eye is set. I'm pretty happy with this shoulder seam the way it is because I think it's going to allow for that room we talked about of the um, of a curl underneath that will take its take its image from this. <laughs> uh, oh yes. Take its take its shape from this basically. So now let's talk about the love cowls. Okay, so I'm just going to pin this better in the front. Now, here's the thing about that um, asymmetry to which I was referring. If you are wearing, if your gown is made from a heavy fabric or from heavy layers, um, it, it can hide that asymmetry if your asymmetry isn't too severe. So you have to decide whether you want to screw around with fitting. Sorry, there was a mosquito. In my hair? In your hair. That's, that's awesome. Yep. Confused mosquito from the wind. <laughs> So you have to decide whether you want to fiddle around with fitting two sides, two separate sides, or if you just want to uh, call it good enough. It's up to you. Um, and you know your body, or hopefully you know your body. You know whether it is uh, super asymmetrical or mildly asymmetrical or not asymmetrical at all. Right, that's, that's always up to you. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you what's going on in the back here now that we've made all of these adjustments in a moment. But first, I'm just going to show you the, the front. So here, you can see what I meant by it becomes a fold, a turn back, a turn back collar, right? Really easy. That's all from one piece, and it just folds back on itself, and it folds back from the point of the shoulder where the that little shoulder seam meets the, the back seam. And when you're, when you're creating, when you're fitting your lapel, um, your front lapel, you want to make sure that it's, you smooth it up like this so that there are no wrinkles. And that's going to then tell you, that's going to then tell you where you need to put your, your seam and your cut. And make sure that you're actually going to the point where it meets, where the, the two shoulder seams meet, the front and back shoulder seam meet. Make sure that's all correct and and if you need to make if you smooth up and you realize you need to make adjustments maybe you need to move this shoulder seam a little bit the point at which the back and the front at the shoulder meet then you should do so now now obviously also her kirtle is going to probably change the shape of her bust a little bit too um, possibly but once you get that in a full heavy fabric it, it'll be much less sensitive than a thin fabric like this is. So I'm just smoothing up, and seeing where it's going to sit, and checking that it actually meets at the right place. And if I need to adjust that. Just adjusted that a little bit to follow. You know, it's got this nice smooth, smooth fold here, and I had to adjust that a little bit. So it was originally here where the shoulder joints met, and now I'm going to make the meat there instead to follow that. Now, you can change, of course, how much you want this to curve out. If you want it to be slightly straighter, that's fine. You can see both sort of the more boat-shaped, the more boat-shaped drape, and you can also see the straighter drape, different gowns, different styles. Obviously, you're gonna have a little variety, and that's, that's fine. Okay, so then what this has done to the back, adjusting that seam has done to the back. That's 
some rebelling happening from the ends in the center. Oh. Haughty things. Shoot. Now that we've got that, oh, the other thing I need to do then also, of course, on the front lapel, um, is draw where it should, you know, actually, where the seam should go so that it lays nice and flat across her shoulder. You're going to see the interesting shape that's going to create when we take it out and I trim it up. <laughs> For those who weren't here at the beginning, you're going to see something interesting. Maybe interesting. Who knows? Hopefully it will be interesting. <laughs> um, okay, so got that. And now let's focus on this back seam. Now, this fit perfectly when she had on a kirtle underneath. So I am really loath to adjust this inward at all because that will, uh, again, we'll be faced with a situation where it's too tight across a, a garment, a body. It's too tight across, you know, over top of a proper undergarment. And if you're just tuning in, we took off the coat that she was wearing because it was binding her in the arms in a way that made it impossible to tell whether we needed to do something to the overgarment that this this overgown or if it was just an issue fitting issue with the undergarment it turns out it was a fitting issue with the undergarment so she will be making a new curdle based on this arm's eye so that it will fit because that really seems to be the thing that matters it matters that this arm's eye the arm's eye of the overgown and the arm's eye of the undergown are almost the same it really seems to matter really a lot <laughs> um the arm's eye of the undergown can be smaller, but if the arm's out, eye of the undergown sits more largely, it's a mess. It's a real mess. It's very uncomfortable of your kirtle, specifically in this case for undergown. Okay, so we have here, first we're going to work on the drape of this, and you're going to notice that we don't have enough fabric to actually meet there but if I if I I might actually be able to just continue this piece around to join up with this here so instead of putting the seam of this lapel here I can actually put the seam of this lapel here to actually meet To actually meet where this is falling currently. So that means we'll be cutting there, not there. <laughs> um, right, and so I'm going to go ahead and do anything about that yet. Okay, now we're going to worry about shaping this piece, this, this flap, which you see in so many of the illuminations when you actually order. And, and if you ever get to see the back side of a portrait, you see it in the portraits. And generally what you end up with is this, um, this kind of tear-ish tier shape that kind of follows the curve here and comes down in this cute little tail, which is sort of the vestige, what's left of the vestiges of the high collared gowns of the, of the earlier part of the 15th century. So therefore, I am going to Follow along here, follow along, follow along, and then I'm going to start to go down about here to create that tear shaped, tear shaped end. And the center of this is going to basically be, is going to basically be the center seam of this, more or less, where this comes to going to be basically the same as the center seam. And so I'm just going to actually attempt to use the center seam to trace that up. Now what I what I wasn't paying attention to and I should have been is that when this is over top of a garment, it actually comes up to here. So I needed to actually kind of grab that and pull to create that effect. So there might, we might end up having to rework this once a, we actually have a properly fitted kirtle underneath. That, that is a thing that could very well happen. So 
because you're gonna work from scratch. Yep. So this is unlikely to be the final version of this pattern, but it's a good start. Because I won't be able to help her once she's not here anymore <laughs> with this directly at any rate. I can of course offer guidance and assistance from afar, but. I think there's a huge difference made in, because when we first made this pattern, I had a friend voraciously came over and fitted me with the 14th century one. Neither of us knew what we were doing. You know all the things. Well, I, I know some things. I, I would say I'm constantly learning new things. Yes. But having that knowledge in, the, in the, just listening to you, I am learning so much, which is fantastic fitment, on ease, on how to find fit is significant. So um, so I'll put in a plug for her. If you haven't already, you need to subscribe. You should check out the Patreon. You should try classes because this is the kind of fun things you get to learn when you do those things. So um, when I originally drew, drew this, it was based on where this was slouching to, which is wrong. So I pulled it up again. <laughs> I pulled it up, and so that's giving me a completely different place where this fabric falls in the back, um, where the hangy collar in the back falls. So I'm going to redo that, and first I'm going to pin this this baby in place up here at the shoulder, so that it doesn't um, it doesn't attempt to maneuver to other places because we don't want that. Stay where it will be when it is sewn together. Hopefully where it will be when it is sewn together. We'll mm -hmm. see. <laughs> we will see. Okay, so that now brings this fabric over to here. is certainly trickier without having the final color underneath this particular part, but we apologize. It is what it is. We work we, we roll with the punches as they say. some of this away to get it out of the way so I can get a better feel for well, anything. Yeah, whatever it is I inhaled it might be how much I inhaled a mosquito. Isn't that funny? I was thinking that little bastards die us. mosquitoes die. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, and then I'm just going to go ahead and trim this since I'm here and trimming things. Oh, oh, tip. If you are standing still for a long period of time, like for example, to be fitted, Aim your feet, your heels at each other like this and turn your toes out and that will engage the muscles all down your, your derriere, the backs of your legs, your thighs, all the way to your feet. And then you will be putting no strain on your skeletal structure, but your muscles will be engaged, therefore encouraging circulation and you will get tired less quickly. It's something tribesmen in the Amazon do whenever they're you know, spending a long time stalking prey and if they're not crouching, they're standing. That's what gives them those beautiful asses that you see in National Geographic. No, I'm not making this up. <laughs> <laughs> so if you would like Amazonian tribe derrier, heels together, people, heels together. <laughs> Everyone thinks it's genetic. It's not. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So uh, that's good. I'm going to go ahead and trim this while I'm here anyway. So I'm, what I'm doing now is I'm considering where I want, so her arms, I'm gonna pull her arm forward, and I'm gonna see where folds are created here. And I'm gonna draw there. Because that's honestly where you want, where you want that front seam to go. If you only, but, but only if you ever wanna put your arms forward. <laughs> if you only care about having your arms neatly at your sides in perfect posture, not moving, then don't worry about this. But if you would like to ever put your arms forward, then when you are doing a fitting, fitting for an arm's eye, put your arms forward and have someone draw where that crease happens. Well, okay. that's rather important for dance, too. That's the, all the times it's like these spins. Important if you just want to be able to put your own coif on. Yeah. <laughs> Hair. If you'd like to pick something up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So. Your arm down, so that's the next thing to fit for is for this forward this forward motion um, and if you've never if you've ever fitted a gown and not done that and then wondered why you can't move bend forward that's why. okay so I just accounted for that and then there's also this point over her shoulders so I'm going to just bring that easy to do over the shoulder joint since the pencil wants to literally roll over it, but mm. that's what it is, that's fine. So I am currently cutting this with seam allowances in mind, just so everyone knows. So this includes seam allowances. Which, as I said at the very beginning of this process, in the mist, mist, distant mists of time, <laughs> um, that includes, uh, I don't, I don't like broad seam allowances. I don't like to have waste fabric one, but two, I also don't like to have a lot of bulk in my seams. That would be wild and uncomfortable under the arm too, to have a bulky seam. It really is. Honestly, ladies and gentlemen, I'm hungry and need to take a break. Um, so we're probably going to do the sleeve fitting at a later, <laughs> yes. at another live stream, um, and and the skirts will be an easy thing, yes. an easy thing to do. Okay, well, everyone, I hope you have enjoyed and or benefited somehow from your live with the Creative Contessa fitting experience. If you have any comments or questions, 
drop them in the comments below if you're watching this as a I don't know, on Instagram, can they watch it in retrospect, or does it vanish forever? That's a great question. I don't know. Okay. Well, if you're Sorry. on YouTube, this will, you you might be able to watch this as a recording. Uh, if you're on Instagram, I don't know if you can watch this if you missed it. So if I, you're... <laughs> I think there's a way to save it. I'm, I think so. I one would hope so. Okay, everyone. Otherwise... Oh, thank you for watching. Uh, I'm glad some the comment was, this was so helpful. Thank you so much. Yay, it was. I hope so. Um... So if you have any questions uh, in retrospect, if, you, if there are no comments left to drop it in, then you know send me a message and I'll see what I can do. Um, but ideally, if you do it under the video that creates engagement, blah, blah, blah. You all know, you know the game. Like, subscribe, share, all the good things. Thank you all for watching and I hope to catch you all later. Until next time, guys, stay creative. Say, say uh, goodbye, the gray lady creates. <laughs> the creating ladies, bye. <laughs> I don't know how to end this. <laughs>